Are you excited or is it just me up here? You know? Well, we should be excited because when you look in Bible, there's hope. But if you look in the culture at large, marriage is going about as badly as it can possibly be. Uh, I want to look at some statistics. Very first one is less people are getting married now in America than at any point in our history. Less people are opting in for marriage. The marriage rate is abysmally low. Lowest point ever it's been in the United States history. During the 1940s, it was double the rate that it is now. Double. So holy cow, we are completely declining as people are opting not to marry in the first place. That is very, very alarming news. Second thing is nearly half of all marriages end in divorce. Half of all marriages. A third, most marriages fail within the first eight years. Anybody ever heard of the seven-year itch? This is just putting anecdotal speech according to a real statistic playing out. Most marriages don't last eight years. A fourth one, single-parent homes are at an all-time high. Uh, Across the board, one out of every four kids in the United States are raised in single-parent homes. It's never been nearly uh, like that before. Uh, And this last one, check this out. Four out of every ten people surveyed believe marriage is becoming obsolete. I think if you had um, asked our grandparents' generation this one, I think it'd be zero out of 10. Maybe if I'm wrong, it'd be one out of 10. But 40% of America thinks marriage is becoming obsolete. They're saying, I don't see the point in it. It doesn't look like it works. They're all falling to pieces. Everyone's getting uh, divorced, fighting it out in divorce court and broken. It'd be better if we just gave up on the whole institution together. 40% believes marriage is becoming obsolete. Could it be worse? Yeah, wait till 2025. We're going that way. All the trends are saying we're going from bad to worse. Here are some predictors of divorce. I just cited our grandparents' generation. Now, all these indicators of divorce are present now, but they were really flipped on their head opposite in our grandparents' day. So think about where progressivism has taken us. Progressivism. There's the idea in progressivism that we are go- we're progressing forward in a better way. How do you know you're progressing in the right direction? What if you're progressing in the wrong direction? What would the statistics look like for marriage and divorce if we chose the wrong direction? Well, it would look like what I just showed you, right? Now, here's the indicators, pre-indicators of divorce. See if this looks familiar. Premarital relations. Premarital relations. What was really unthinkable uh, for generations before, nearly all brides, not all, but nearly all, are going to uh, their marriage day as virgins. Now, do you know what percentage of women are going up to the altar in their white dresses as virgins? Less than 5%. Less than 5%. I'm just showing you the cultural trends. I'm not here to be like, and now who it? No, none of that. I'm just saying, culturally speaking, this is a massive shift. We went from 95% to 5%. I made up 95. I think it's something like that. Uh, Before birth control, people were extremely careful. And they held that uh, marriage bed in honor. And it was social scandal. It would be ruinous for you if it got out. And so the stakes sociologically for... Uh, sleeping around, that that was a big deal. Uh, And now it's just kind of like, everybody's doing it. 5%, guys. We wonder why divorce is up. Next thing, cohabitation. Uh, It was something like to the tune of 40 or 45% of uh, Americans have cohabitated before marriage. And if you cohabitate, it greatly increases your chance of divorce. You want to make sure you have divorce? Sleep around and then cohabitate and then get married. It greatly increases your chances of divorce. By the way, virgins divorced less than anyone else. If 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 you're a virgin when you marry, your chances of happily ever after are much greater than everyone else's. And you'll report a happier marriage with a uh, more fulfilling time in the sack. 
I know I'm supposed to be like super holy, but then I'll like use just normal language. Like if I'd said it out there, you'd be like, yeah, word. <laughs> yep, that's cool. But then I'm up here and you're like, no, you're supposed to use like Sunday words. I'm like, no, I'm going to talk the same way right here is out there. You want me to church it up, do a song and dance? Get out of here. Let me be real and raw. All right, number four. Oh, no, number three. Counting is hard. It's just hard. It is. Uh, I got a snort out of someone. That's fantastic. Thanks, Alex. That's great. Uh, No shared religious beliefs. The decline of Christianity and religion in general has been in a free fall in the United States. And so when a couple has no religious affiliation and they are not regularly attending church or whatever worship services and they're not in those shared belief patterns, their chances of divorce skyrockets. Shared religious belongings. There was a uh, statistic that has been debunked absolutely, and that's Christian marriages fail at the same rate the secular ones do, and that statistic ended up being a complete fraud. That is not true. What was happening is, is the statistic was greatly weighed down why everyone was just claiming and checking Christian. But then when you drill down, I'm like, do you believe Jesus is God? I'm like, no. Do you believe in heaven? No. And like just some basic stuff, I'm like, all right, well, you're not a Christian. And so when you refine the statistics, Christian marriages are absolutely far more successful than mainstream secular ones. So if you've heard that statistic, it's an absolute lie. It's not true. If you have a, relig- a shared religious belonging, your chances of happily ever after are greatly increased. Um, let's see another predictor of divorce. If you have been divorced before, as right now, your first marriage, statistically speaking, has a 50% shot. If you get divorced, your second marriage now has a 67% chance uh, of ending in divorce. And if you get married a third time, uh, the chances you will get divorced now goes to 73%. The more you divorce, the more you divorce. Now, some of you will be like, well, I mean, I think God can rescue me in my second marriage. Yeah, great. Don't, I'm just giving you the math. Don't jump ahead to my sermon, people. Can you stay on track, please? I'm doing the thing. I do this, the math. Math shouldn't be offensive, but again, math is hard and probably, probably bad. Uh, the, the last one, if your parents are divorced or if your parents have never married, another uh, indicator of divorce. What this all means, is it that it's hopeless for you and I? What it means is culture has no idea how to do marriage. And if you just go along with whatever is popular, you're going to be uh, divorced and your home is going to break. And your children will pay the uh, uh, penalty for it, just like you will. Here's an experiential thing, because all these, it's kind of like out there, it's like statistics that I pulled from all kinds of different CDC and Pew Research and uh, Lifeway, and I'm grabbing statistics from all over. There's just some of my work cited, so I did my homework. I didn't just make it up. Uh, but practically, experientially, how many marriages do you know of that are really flourishing? And now, if you're like three months in, no, that jury's still out. Y'all, y'all been married for 30 seconds. You, 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 way to go. Love it. Yeah. All right. Party. Wait till your first fight. Get, wait till you're like one year in and you're like, oh, so this is actually hard. I'm like, yeah, it's hard, bro. It's hard. Let's get like 10 years in. Who's 10 years in? Think right now. Who has a marriage that is 10 years old or older and the fire hasn't gone out? Like, it's still like hot and heavy passionate. Like, if, you, if their kids walked into the kitchen, they see them like making out. You're like, whoa, <laughs> hey, sorry, get a room. And they're like, yeah, it's this room. Get out, kids. <laughs> we, oh, we got this room. Fantastic. So, yeah, are they still best friends after 10 years? Do they love each other passionately? How many marriages do you know of 10 years in or more that still have that? Can you count them on one hand? So maybe you got a few. Can, do you have a few? Some have, how, how many has like none? That's hurtful because you know me. I'm like, we're, you're killing it, baby. What's up? We're doing it, baby. In the name of Jesus, we're doing it. 
<laughs> um, maybe it's less than two hands. Out of the thousands of marriages you know, you could only really recall less than 10 that, that's a pretty bleak and dismal picture between the statistics I just gave you and the experience right under your nose. It looks like marriage is going very badly. However, people are still getting married. Even if it doesn't end in divorce, maybe you just end up being glorified roommates. You thought you would be different, you would be special, and then a little bit of fighting rolls into bitterness and contempt, and before you know it, separate bedrooms, it's cold uh, marriage, you're fighting all the time, you don't even really like each other, and you're just going through time as a glorified roommate, but that fire has gone out. What of that? Still, even with all of that, People are falling in love and ready to get married. Why? Well, I think the only possible explanation is, is you are hardwired for it. You want to do it. It doesn't matter. I've seen, um, I've seen online uh, feminists who just, I don't need a man, I don't want a man, and then she falls in love and completely like 180, and then she's wearing the like uh, traditional outfits and baking and just love it. It's just like a full flip. And she just fell in love, and all of a sudden, just kind of her inner wiring jumped over. Um, by the way, somebody's going to misunderstand me. I'm like, John, do you think marriage means you have to dress like a 1940s wife? And a je Yes, that's what I was saying. No, I'm not saying that, you goon. Come on, stay on track. Don't sharpshoot so much. I was just drawing a little bit of a word picture. It was, it was great fun. But I notice it's hardwired into us, marriage. We want to commit to someone. We want to promise to love them forever. We want a loud declaration. We want to write it in the sky. I want to commit to you forever. Though all evidence and statistics seem to the contrary, let's roll the dice. You and me, let's do something crazy. Let's get married. I think we're hardwired for it. So marriage is here to stay. Even though it's declining, people have not given up on marriage. You're wired for it. But here's the truth. We're terrible at it. Mainstream culture is terrible at marriage. You would think, after all the statistics that I just gave you, people would clue in and be like, you know what? Let's just do it how our grandparents did marriage, or our great-grandparents. This, this is a new phenomenon that we are failing this bad. Maybe we should just go back from our progressive agenda and unwind all the woke, feministic, blah, blah, blah. Let's wind it all back and let's retread some ancient paths. It looked like happily ever after was more possible in ages gone by than ours. Let's unearth some old wisdom. I'm so glad that you landed there because that's what we're going to do. We're going to do marriage by the book stuff. What does the Bible say about marriage? A lot, actually. A lot. Marriage is a central theme of the Bible. Marriage isn't just something in the Bible. Marriage is actually a theme that emanates from cover to cover. Think about this. The Bible starts with a marriage. Adam and Eve, where God himself brings them together. So seeing man is created alone, doesn't have a companion. God brings him a... Uh, Brings him the most beautiful woman in the world, because she's the only one, but she's the most beautiful woman in the world. She's wearing his favorite outfit, and they get married. It's fantastic, right? <laughs> Officiates the first marriage. The delay was is me trying to figure out what I could say with your kids in the room. And I'm like, nope, the joke's good. I got to say the joke. That's really good. Prettiest girl in the room, wearing, boost, uh, yeah, wearing the um, birthday suit. So anyway... Marriage in the garden. Now, if you go all the way to Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, you see the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what we see is the entire church, you and I, caught up into heaven preparing for the most epic party that all human history has been uh, gathering toward, this marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's where you and I, as the church, and all the saints before all human history gathered together as this uh, 
a massive bridal party where we're going to marry King Jesus forever. Now, the marriage thing, some dudes are going to be like, I'm not, I'm not marrying a dude. Bro, no, marriage, think of this. Marriage is the most intimate relationship you can pass, possibly have. It's all needs, all, all the inner heart stuff receives their amen in your creator. Your soulmate actually isn't your spouse. It's Jesus Christ. Your soulmate is Jesus. There's a hole in your heart. It's God-sized. Only God can fill it. Only God can complete and fix you. And whereas that, that, that doesn't take love from my wife, that plugs me into the source of love so I can love her far better. You see? Some people are like, no, 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 soulmate's my spouse. That's a sweet romantic thing. I'm like, it's actually borders more of an idolatrous thing. Your soulmate's Jesus, plug into him, the source of all love, and now I can love my wife fully. I'm completed by Jesus so I can overflow with love and affection, not requiring her to fix me as if I'm some broken half uh, in of myself. I'm a whole man. I'm filled up by the Holy Spirit. I have love and responsibility and, 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 and gifts, and I'm able to throw that to my wife, and she's able to do that, and so we're loving out of abundance, right? And so that is the uh, general idea. Marriage is a central theme of the Bible from cover to cover. Begins with a marriage, ends with a marriage, where we will marry uh, Jesus Christ, Savior, for all eternity. Now, I want to break up I have five major points on what marriage is according to the Bible. We've already seen how crucial it is and that it is a major theme of the Bible. Uh, the very first thing I want to point out is marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman for life. That's what it has always been, a covenant between man and wife. Now, this word isn't something that's used very often. We understand contract in our day and age. A contract looks like this. Hey, you do X, Y, Z, and I will do one, two, three. Both of us have our responsibilities, and we form a contract. You keep your side, and I'll keep my side. If you default on your uh, piece of the agreement, well, now we can nullify the agreement. This is a contract, and all of you have engaged in them, and you understand them quite well. That is not the idea for a biblical marriage. And if you treat your marriage according to contract think, you're going to destroy it. You will keep a record of rights and wrongs that your spouse is secretly not living up to, but you are over, you are giving generously on your side of the contract. They're not meeting theirs. Hey, you're supposed to do X, Y, Z. That's the deal. That's the contract. I'm like, no, no, no. A biblical covenant, a biblical marriage is something completely different. It is the most romantic gesture ever conceived of, and it is by God for us. Uh, um, Hollywood has never produced anything so romantic as just any typical Christian marriage. They can't conceive of it. The best they can do is, and then uh, he won the princess and they lived happily ever after. It's all about the chase with Hollywood. But they don't know how to get into the trenches and actually once a, a relationship has started to actually bring it about. Isn't that interesting? All the romance movies are about the chase. It's about getting her. But that's really for us, that's where the romance starts. It's not just the hunt. It's no, I got her and now I'm going to let her go a little bit and then I'm going to hunt her again. And that's called marriage. It's super fun. You're supposed to hunt her forever right? Great, wild fun. Hollywood has no idea how to do romance. Zero. And this is how good a covenant marriage is. Baby. I wasn't planning on this, but this is fun. <laughs> I promise to love you forever, for better or for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. Amen. I'd marry you again, you know. You want to marry now? I'm a pastor, I think. Can I officiate my own remarriage here? She's looking so cute. I don't have to. Pastor Chris is right there. Pastor Chris would do it. I do. Say, ask her if she will. Yeah, baby! Woo! 
that just happened, remarried during a sermon. That's never happened before. You just witnessed history. Nobody has been so dorky to conceive of such a stupid idea and pull it off in real time with no planning. Look at all these witnesses that gathered as well. That was wonderful. In church, by a pastor, I just need to sign something. I'll just, sign, you know, anyway, I'm, uh, I got distracted. But l- let's break down the wedding vows. The wedding vows are basically just a synthesis of all the Bible has to say about what marriage really is. And so I'm saying in these vows, it's just basically a systematic theology of what marriage is. Okay, I promise to love you for better or for worse. When things are going really well or when everything's a train wreck disaster and I'm miserable and so are you. I promise to love you when I'm miserable. I promise to love you whether we're rich and we could shop around. I promise to love you when we're abject, poverty, poor. I promise to love you whether I get really sick or you do. Uh, You're paralyzed. You have some horrible disease. You're bedridden for life. That's going to affect, I, no matter what. I do, it doesn't matter what happens. Forever, no matter what. When I don't feel like it, when you don't deserve it, you stop loving me, I'll still love you forever. You start hating me, and I'll love you forever. You don't do your part of the covenant, it doesn't release me from my part. I said this forever and ever, no matter what, period. That's the most romantic thing I've ever heard. And that is just a basic Christian marriage. I'll love you forever, no matter what. Now, modern marriages aren't built on that at all. I love you until I don't feel like loving you anymore. That's really what they're doing. Well, you know, I just wasn't happy anymore. And all the girlfriends gather around like, well, if he doesn't make you happy, you deserve to be. And it's that kind of thing. It's like, it's more of a contract. And let me rewrite the vows to what they actually mean. I love how you make me feel, and I promise to love you as long as you keep making me feel happy. That's what marriage, that's what it really is. That's the contract that they do. They don't understand covenant, and so their marriages are failing epically. The church also can adopt this kind of erroneous thinking, and when we do, our marriages are doomed at the altar. You got me? It's a covenant. Forever, no matter what. Jesus commands us to love our enemies. Now, this love, it's not a smushy feeling kind of love. That's not biblical love. Love is doing it even if you don't feel like it. So we just had a fight. She said some stuff. She hurt my feelings. And I'm supposed to be a man, so I'm not supposed to admit that I have feelings. But she did. She hurt my feelings. And really, she needs to apologize. And I'm right on this. And, you know, but still, even in the midst of that, when you don't deserve to be forgiven or treated well, you do something nice for them anyway. Not because they, you deserve it, but because, nope, that's the deal. Stubborn, active love. It's a verb. If you can love your enemies, that means acting in a good, benevolent way toward them, even when you don't feel like doing it. How much more should we love our spouses? Doesn't matter whether they deserve it. Uh, It doesn't matter if you feel like it. No, love is a verb. If you love with verb uh, enough, the feelings kind of come and go. I mean, you're in awful pain and you're feeling miserable and whatever. Feelings come and go, but I'm going to love you. Verb as a matter of will and decision and covenantal promise forever. That's what marriage is. That means you get through the doldrum of when the feelings aren't really there. In surviving that awful season where many would have thrown in the towel, it can blossom into something outrageously wonderful as you two have gone through the trenches together like good soldiers and in the midst of a fight that was awful, horrifying, scary, miserable, and torturous, you arrive together and you were closer through it. You can fight through the pain. And it's your covenant that gets you through it, right? You covenant. Man, I am really preaching this sermon. Uh, (laughs) 
Uh, This is nothing more than just a picture of the gospel. And this is why God intended our marriages to take on a covenant, because that's exactly how he rescues us. Jesus rescues us through covenant. Check it out. Hosea chapter 2. And before we go there, let me give you some context. There was a priest, a good and godly man by the name of Hosea. Hosea was ministering to a terrible, perverted people. It was kind of the decline of the northern uh, empire of Israel right before it fell. Uh, right before it fell, uh, luxurious, prosperous, uh, perverted, sexualized. Anyway, he is ministering to this group. Now he marries a prostitute. He's told to, and so this is already extremely weird behavior because God tells us later in Corinthians 7 and 2 Corinthians 6 that Christians are only supposed to marry Christians, right? Anyway, uh, he marries a prostitute, and this ends up being a picture of the gospel. So God is doing something very unique here, like parting a Red Sea. He did that once, right? And so he is doing this once. He's like, go take for yourself uh, Gomer, who is a prostitute. So he does. He marries her. They have some kids, going okay. And then she cheats, and she cheats, and she cheats, and she cheats, publicly humiliating him. Now, the godly man, I think, has an out. He could divorce her. How how dare you? Gone. Um, But instead, the Lord instructs uh, Hosea to do something wild and lavish. She says, no, go to her and take her back. Now, I want to start picking up uh, in Hosea 2, verse 13. Now, it's talking about uh, his adulterous wife. She burned offerings to them, speaking of idols, and adorned herself with ring and jewelry. She was looking good. And went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. So, just like she's cheating on her husband, the Lord's saying, yeah, yeah, but you are my faithless bride. You people have been faithless to God. God's taking the adultery that happened in that marital relationship and saying, yep, that's exactly like what all you people do to me when you're faithless. You are all an adulterous people. That's what God's saying. And God could just say, yep, you want to cheat? You want to go do your own thing? Have at it. Goodbye. And God could give us a divorce. It's called hell for us divorcing us. And so that's what she deserved. That's what you and I deserve. But in verse 14, and this should blow you away. This is wild, reckless, stubborn love of God. This is the kind of husband you're looking at in Jesus. Therefore, behold, God says, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I'll give her the vineyards and make the valley of Acre a door of hope. And, they, and there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. He's remembering this long saga of his people where he rescued us and nursed us through the desert, loving us. And still we grew up after all he'd done, cheated, was faithless. He could have divorced and sent us away, but instead he says in that day, declares the Lord, you shall, know, uh, you shall call me my husband and will no longer uh, look after the Baals. That, that's a, a false idol. In verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth to you, me, uh, you to me in righteousness and in justice, steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. That's just a beautiful picture of the gospel. It's loving the unlovable. It's loving the faithless. It's the perfect illustration and picture of how we have cheated after God and gone after a million other lovers. What is it that you love? Is it your lust? Is it money? Is it power? Is it popularity? Is it your job and and, and what you, you... You get from that? Is it your own kids? Is it romantic relationships in general? What what, what is that idol? What are you putting above Jesus? You've been faithless to him. 
and he could just divorce you, but instead, he leads us out into quiet pastures, he rescues us, and he renews the marital covenant with us forever. It's a covenant. Isn't that cool? It's the most beautiful picture uh, of romance of all time. Um, the very first thing we talked about of what marriage is, is covenant. I'm going to race through these others because you guys got way carried away. So I'm going to have to make up some time here. Point to, do y'all like how I always blame you for things I clearly did wrong? I don't even feel bad about it. Number two, marriage is about two becoming one. In Genesis chapter two, verse 18, uh, the Bible says this, the Lord said, it is not good that the man shall be alone. I'll make him a helper fit for him. So you imagine this, mankind without woman, man in perfect utopia. You're in paradise. Everything's going great. And God looks down and sees, yeah, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make him a companion. I'm going to make him a helper. What God is showing us in this is that mankind is a relational being. Made in the image of God, we are relational. Why? Because God is relational. The God of the Bible isn't like the pagan gods, the simple ones that you and I would have written if we just made up God like the other religions do. What other religions do is they take man and they just write him large. Zeus and Ares and Poseidon or whatever, you just imagine a man big and they're kind of sinful and kind of good sometimes and they have their quirks, but that's the paganism. That's all the different deities. Christianity is far different. Uh, we, have what's, uh, we have, through the Bible, uh, the only God who exists eternally as a trinity. This makes very little sense to us, but we're just getting the mail. What that means is eternity past. Before there was a single speck in the cosmos, no planets, no stars, God existed eternally. Always just has existed as the unmoved mover. And he's existed forever in three persons, but one God. That's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. Three persons, but one God. There is one God in three persons. This means God is, in essence, relational. So when uh, God, who cannot change, says God is love, that's possible because God is relational. The copycat religion, which took Christianity, discounted the New Testament and added a sword. We call it Islam. It's Christianity warped and weaponized, says Allah, who is not a triune God, is love. How could that be? If Allah is not a trinity like the God of the Bible, how was he loving? Who was he loving before there was anything? And once he added something, creation to love, now that God has changed and become loving for the first time because love can only exist if there's someone else to love. So it, it, it ends up being an actual an apologetic. One is you'd never come up with a God that was triune. We would erase that inconvenient logical consistency that we can't grasp. It doesn't make it inconsistent. It just means it's paradoxical and that we can't wrap our heads around it. Similarly, like I, I can't understand how God could be outside of time. Like he made time and all things. I, 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 can't, I can't get all that. I, I don't understand how God could see the end of our days and the beginning of our days at the same time. That's incomprehensible. It doesn't make sense that God could bring everything from nothing. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense how God can be three and one, one and three. Doesn't make sense. And you're not going to get the mail. You got this tiny little peon finite ant brain compared to the Almighty. So get used to disappointment, guys. You're not going to get it. But holy cow, we got a relational God who made us in our, his own image, and so we are relational as well. And so what God wants for us is relational man to come together with relational woman, and the two becomes one flesh. Here, check it out. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's what God wants in a marriage, oneness. Uh, now, um, I'll, I'll very quickly say this in a, uh, as a caveat, and we'll go into this more in week three, which is the Q&A, all these different questions. Uh, most of you will marry. There are some that won't. 
God has a plan for that as well. It's in Corinthians 7. So you can still be a relational being in that we're not alone on the earth. Solitary confinement, you would lose your mind. But here, we are relational here. Even if you're not married here, you can be relational with other people. And so you are not alone in that sense. So I think in the most intimate sense possible, God says not good for man to be alone. The, the most intimate relationship possible for man is in a marriage. But you can still be relational, not in a marriage. And so those of you who haven't gotten married yet understand that you are still um, within the will of God and you don't have to marry uh, one day. Some of you young ladies were like, but I will, right? I'm like, I don't know, probably, <laughs> probably. We'll, we'll pray you up. But anyway, let's understand how to do marriage by the book so that if you do get a spouse, you'll actually be able to keep them. So staying on track here. Uh, most intimate relationship possible. Uh, what oneness allows you to do is inside of a covenant, which we've already built, it allows you to know someone fully, not the picture of themselves they present, not the the best foot forward, you know? Uh, but I remember my wife, <laughs> she had just had some nasal surgery. This was many years ago. And she came out of surgery, and I kind of walk in looking for like, whoa. <laughs> you know, she looked like she'd just gone through surgery, which was beautiful. <laughs> um, and she was delirious. She was kind of coming out of a fog. And the doctor just said, here, put this ice pack on your face. And she kept repeating that word, those words, ice pack on the face, <laughs> ice pack on the face. Like she was confused by it. Like she was having an existential moment where she wanted to really understand philosophically this thing called ice pack on the face. And so anyway, but I, I mean, I've seen you in those moments. Uh, and you've seen me in mine, you know, in my unattractive moments. It's hard to picture, right? <laughs> nope, she sees them. Oh, I feel so vulnerable. Here we go. So she's seen me at my worst. She's seen me when I was angry. She's seen me when I was um, uh, sinful. When I, I, my ugliest faces, there's no real hiding from your spouse. They can look far past your perfect curated social media profile and they know who you really are and you know their junk too and still safe within the covenant you are able to know each other the good the bad and the ugly and still love each other one of your core biggest desires is to know someone deeply and intimately you love them you want to know everything about them I want to know more. Remember early in your dating, you wanted to stay up till 3 a.m. just talking all night. Teach me everything about this woman, right? Uh, and you also want to be fully known. This is a human phenomenon as well. In our growth track, which is happening right after church, is how you become uh, involved with Grace City Church. And it's how you can get on teams to start serving. You'll end up doing this, uh, what is it called? Um, it's a self-analysis test. It tells you, what do we call it? CVI, that's right, CVI. And you learn all kinds of this cool stuff about yourself and you find out whether you're uh, like a, a builder or a banker or uh, one of these others. And everyone's like comparing notes because it's really fun to kind of get to know yourself a little. And then other people, and you're comparing notes, anybody that's done a personality test or Enneagram or whatever you're doing, Myers-Briggs. It's so fun to kind of figure out yourself and you want to show people, you want to tell people how you are and you want them to know you and you want to know other people too. We desire intimacy. We desire that oneness. And in a marriage, in a marriage covenant, you are free in that relationship exclusively to be completely raw, unabashed, this is the ugliest I get, and this is the best I get, and they'll love you no matter what. They didn't marry the little social media avatar that you created for them. They really know you. You love them, and they love you, warts and all. It's about oneness in that way, and oneness can't come without vulnerability. It's the only way. Oneness is an invitation to know someone and to be fully known. 
That's what oneness really is. It's to take them into your very being. Um, we'd said this, Becca fishes sometimes when she uh, wants, uh, uh, when she just wants to hear it one more time. She's like, so do you love her? <laughs> That's the most guilty laugh. And I'm like, yes, I do. I love you. And you're like, you don't. And I'm like, I do. And she's inviting me to pursue her, right? Um, super sweet. Uh, that, uh, but I'm chasing her. And she's drawing me. Uh, and she says, do you love me? And I'm like, love you. I am you. And by vice versa, it feels like we have that oneness is the goal. Practically speaking, oneness could mean, well, the obvious physical manifestation of oneness. Wink. Uh, there's values. We're sharing. Va- well, we got like little three-year-olds and stuff in here. And I don't know how to moderate here. The internet's watching. We were like, just say it, man. I'm like, I got the little cute kid looking at me here. And later he's going to be like, mommy, and then you'll hate me. And so I'm trying to do the thing. So anyway, there's oneness. Do your homework. Uh, Then there's values. We're one in that we share the same values. Uh, We worship the same God. We're on the same mission. We've got the same goals. We share the same bank accounts. We have the same possessions. You don't have stuff and she has her stuff. You have everything in common. She doesn't have rooms and I have rooms. Nope, we have a house, right? Um, And so it's not your stuff and her stuff. Your separate bank accounts. One life, uh, one bank account, one bed, one uh, oneness, right? That's what marriage is, is we're coming together uh, to even eat. Corinthians 7 even says something uh, amazing to show how this uh, works. Corinthians 7 talks about your body is no longer yours. It belongs to your spouse. And their, spa- their body belongs to you as well. You don't even have full autonomy over your own body anymore in a marriage as it, I literally gave my entire self to you. When you gave yourself to them in marriage, Did you mean it? That means, so quite literally, we are one in that sense. Baby, this is yours. You're welcome. Every dude's like, yeah, you got her. That's funny. Yeah, it is. All right, so uh, oneness. Uh, The next one I want to talk about is uh, godly offspring. So this is three. What is marriage? Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is the two becoming one, and marriage is meant to produce godly children. We're going to do this more on week four, but I want to just pause and say that children are such a blessing from the Lord. You can see spoiled kids that aren't really being disciplined well, and they can drive you nuts, uh, and, you can, um, and you can start drawing pictures of, ah, oh, kids look miserable. I'm like, no, they don't have to be. Kids can be a absolute obvious blessing from the Lord, where of like even with a hard day and uh, things have been harried or frustrated and there's been difficulties, you still sneak into the room at night and you just watch them sleep. And you get your spouse right there and you're like, hey, we did that, huh? That's awesome. Look at this guy. Then they're growing up, you know, and you get to just watch them and cheer them on and they make you proud. Some of the greatest moments in my life have been attached to my kids. I remember when John Lucas was born, I held him up and I just, I didn't know what to do, but look at him. And I I remember I made a declaration to the stars, you know, just, I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you everything. I, I didn't plan it. That's just what came out. Why? I don't know. That's just what came out. I'm going to teach you everything. And from that moment, I was looking forward to the stories I would read to them, the movies we would watch, the mountains we would climb. I was looking forward to wrestling him, or I was looking forward to teaching him how to work and growing him into masculinity. I loved that little boy from the first moment I set eyes on him, and the Lord gave him to us as the great, great blessing so that our days would be filled with laughter and one day grandkids, maybe, hopefully, Maybe there's some cute girls around 10, 8 in here. Grow them up. Grow them well. It's my daughter-in-law you're raising there. You better be doing a good job. Do a better job. Uh, So anyway, I remember when Judah was born, 
I didn't have a declarative moment. I remember just holding him and just roaring with laughter. I couldn't handle it. I was weeping and roaring with laughter. I won't do it here. I couldn't read it, but holy cow, man, kids are a blessing from the Lord. Let's read uh, Malachi 2. Uh, Malachi 2 uh, speaks about marriage. And because it's relevant to some of the other stuff we talked, I, I didn't just take kids are a blessing part, uh, but I put in some more marriage stuff because it sums up some other stuff. Malachi 2 is really great. She is your companion and your wife by covenant. See, I didn't lie. It's the covenant thing, like I said, for you who didn't believe me. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? That's something to earmark and go into, guys. And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, Uh, God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Within the loving marital covenant, the two becoming one, bringing up kids in that relationship, God is desiring to extend your faith to the other generations past. God is seeking in your union godly offspring, and it is a blessing from the Lord when we're able to do it. Marriage is... Let's sum up this again. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is the two becoming one. Marriage is meant to produce godly children. And then the next one is to make you holy more than happy. People get this wrong all the time. They think marriage is meant to make you happy. I think a really healthy marriage most of the time gives you happiness. All of the time should give you joy. That means joy is strong enough and broad enough that even when you're fighting and mad at each other, you still have a joy of having that person in general. Even though you're upset, you're not doing great that, in, in that moment, you're not happy, it's not really all about happiness. Your marriage is meant to do something called sanctify you. The Lord has this relationship to make you a better human. Uh, Let me prove it to you in Ephesians 5, and then I'll tell you a quick story. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. There's lots to unpack here. I'll be unpacking this verse next week, so make sure you come in for the second in Married for Life series. But I want to focus instead on the obvious reading on this word, sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. God's desire is, is like in a marriage covenant with us, is to make us better. It's to sanctify us. It's to complete us. Marriage is one of the greatest possible ways to make you better. It's a constant challenge. One of the early lessons that Beck and I had to learn is that we were both selfish people who thought we weren't. Marriage uncovered that right away. I was out of the military. I was in college. I had a little bit of money because I was always at war and getting, you know, uh, getting paid and not spending it. And so when I got out of the military and I went to college and I met this beautiful girl uh, in all of our friend group, I was the guy who'd like take everyone out to eat. I was generous. When an offering plate uh, passed in our college ministries, I didn't put in coupons. I put in actual money, unlike any of the other college kids. And it was more. You know, I, I had some means and I felt like I was a pretty selfless guy. The evidence that I held in front of me of my good works and selflessness was apparent to all. This was long ago. But then I would go home and I'd like binge watch TV shows and like I'd watch the whole Lord of the Rings. I'd do whatever I wanted for the rest of the day. Then fast forward, I get married and all of my me time evaporates immediately into we time. And so now it's kind of like, you, all right, big day, did all my stuff, all right, huh, collapse into a chair and now I'm going to read. And then after I've settled into my second paragraph, I hear a little, so what do you want to do? 
I'm, I'm doing it. I'm reading. I'm bored. Oh, I'm sorry you're bored. You should do something about that. Maybe find a book. Stop bothering me. I'm reading. It, I didn't have the me time. You're laughing because you're like, how'd that go? It went bad. That went bad. I was a dumb young husband. But I felt like entitled. No, like I've done the stuff. I, I'm, I'm tired. I just want to fall in to the me time and not have to, well, I'll be romantic and love you after I've, you know, spent mm, two, three, four, five, six hours doing whatever I want to do. But all of a sudden, everything became this discussion on what we were going to do. Where do you want to eat? I want to eat at Waffle House. I don't want Waffle House. All right, where do you want? I don't know. What do you think? I think Waffle House. <laughs> you know? Uh, this is a ubiquitous converse, uh, like struggle. All men don't care. We don't care. We'll eat wherever. You know? I, I, I would rather skip the food. I just go without food than argue about where we go. I'm like, I don't care. Anything. Anything. You choose. But women don't want you to do that. They don't want to present something. They want you to give them a list where they just knock stuff down until you get about 18 deep and they'll be like, ah, oh, well, that's good. And then when you're close, they do this just to screw with us, guys. They're like, you're almost there. They're like, what about Waffle House, though? We're like, I just said the Waffle House one. You infuriating and glorious creatures. We will never crack the code of you beautiful enigma boxes. Holy cow, man. <laughs> I wasn't built for this. I was a young door-kicking army ranger trying to figure out how to selflessly love my wife, and I couldn't figure her out for the longest. Now, 18 years in, I don't understand her. Uh, what our relationship unveiled was I had so much selfishness and I had to grow. It took a couple years of our, uh, you know, that kind of first three months honeymoon phase. Crazy fun, guys. That was awesome. Then it got not so awesome. In our first couple years, I'll tell this more in the weeks to come. Our, our kind of um, uh, personal stories will come out. It got really, really hard. She was a bit more of a man-eater than she realized I was brash and rude. Uh, I was. We both had, and we both were dealing with a lot of pride and selfishness. Though we were both Christians, we didn't realize our own junk. She had her junk. I had my junk. And we were colliding an unstoppable force and an immovable object. And our first two years was hard. We, had to re we didn't just fall into happily ever after. I'm like, no, no, no. We went to war for a couple years. We were trying to figure out how to do marriage, and we didn't really have any good examples in front of us. It was hard-won lessons following, trying to follow this. Now, it's paid dividends, and I've walked through the fire, and we have uh, a lot of things to tell you about what not to do. We've figured some stuff out along the way. In year three, marriage starting to get really good. And it, what happened is God had taken us as we were more selfish, most of your fights happen because you're selfish and prideful. Almost everything out there. It's pride and selfishness, which is you and your junk. And then the rest of it's kind of like just communication problems. He said, she said, I wish you'd said it this way. Well, I wish you'd heard it this other way. That kind of thing. So this is, all, this is giving you a taste of next week. So all this stuff, kind of the in the weeds, next week we're in the weeds. But anyway we grew and became more selfless people over those first two years. It was the friction and contending and the prayer and the filling up of the Holy Spirit so that two sinners could somehow become selfless and happily married. It was hard one work, but the Lord sanctified us so that we were capable of being good at marriage. Year three was great. Year four was awesome. Year five, even better. And then we had kids. And kids, a blessing and wonderful, they did nothing wrong. They exposed that we were still more selfish than we knew. Because now 
where of like, all right, I don't have as much me time anymore. I got a little bit, but it's really we time. Then all other time is now sucked up by keeping these little blinking slugs alive. They need bottles and burping and swaddling. How many of you guys are swaddle pros? I mean to brag. I, am, I can swaddle anything. Christian, how much do you weigh? What do you weigh? 220, I can swaddle him right now. 225, easy. Oh, I can do it like a rodeo. Boom, swaddle. We figured it out, but man, it was a lot of hard work. It was difficult. I found myself jealous for my wife because all of her primary time and attention went to keeping this little kid alive, you know? And I had to work through some of that difficulty. It was a struggle, but kids revealed another layer of, I need to become even more selfless and even more strong. And that's a problem if you aren't strong enough in selflessness already. Now, again, the opportunity to struggle and be sanctified grew. And then what we found is, is the Lord strengthened us in what was very difficult before wasn't really hard anymore. Now our boys are bigger, and it's actually just a real great blessing. We go everywhere together. We have all kinds of fun family memories, and life is kind of going very, very well. We're in a really happy season of flourishing so that our own home is happy and good enough so that we can really go on mission together, face out, and be able to bear responsibility around. You know, we're working a homeschool convention this last week. We woke up in Cincinnati, Ohio last night, or uh, yesterday morning, and we were there speaking to, you know, of like we did thousands of people and all these homeschool things. We had a booth, and my 10 and 11-year-old sons are working point of sale and selling books and merchandise and stuff, and they're over there. It's like, um, and I just had a moment where I'm looking, I'm like, team level, let's go, come on. Woo! You know, like I just felt so on mission and proud of my family. Uh, and that's this season. I don't know what season's down the road. I don't know what the Lord has. Uh, it, it could be a very dark season. M- m- I have no idea. Sickness, tragedy, law. I have no idea. Uh, and it may, we may enter a season where, well, life is actually a lot harder. It comes and goes, and the Lord brings it about, and whether he's giving blessing or whether he's giving us the opportunity in strife, conflict, and loss, he gives us the opportunity to grow through sanctification. All is for the glory of the king. From dust we came to dust we uh, will return, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Either way, blessed be the Lord. We're enjoying this season. We've had bad seasons or hard seasons before. We will have hard seasons ahead, but whether we're high or low, we're going to keep chasing Jesus. And when we're not strong enough to deal with stuff, he'll make us stronger in sanctification. He'll make us better. You're not strong enough to deal with your marriage problems? Great. Go to the Lord. That's where strength comes from. Your love is run dry. Great, run to Jesus. That's where love comes from. You don't know how to communicate? Great, go to the author of communication. He can help with all of it. And the idea is, is she chases Jesus, I chase Jesus, and as we go toward him, we grow closer. Pretty cool? Let me close with this. Oh, uh, I missed a point. Guys, y'all have got to... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I don't want to shame you, but come on. Point five, marriage is a blessing. Though it's true, marriage is more about making you holy than it is about happy. Happy's good. Happy kind of comes and goes. Marriage is about making you holy. It's about growing you as a person. Marriage can also be an immense blessing. Here's two proverbs. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18, 22. Proverbs 31, 10. An excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. This is both pointing out the wife. I don't think God pointed out the husband because it's just so obvious we're a blessing. That's what I think. I think it's just so obvious. I mean, Becca, look. Ta-da! Far more precious than jewels? Maybe pushing it? Probably pushing it. Marriage is a blessing from the Lord. Let me close uh, with this. What's, what kind of marriage do you want? I don't really care what's behind you and what 
tragedy and hurt. And yeah, we deal with that, but let's look forward. Forgetting what lies behind, let's forge today a fresh start in our marriages. Forgiving each other as God showed forgiveness in Hosea. Let's forge ahead, recommit our covenant. Uh, Remember, not a contract. Ditch the list of how they've wronged you. Ditch the list of how much you've done for them, but they didn't do these other things. Remember in Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. We're trying to outdo each other in affections. We're not trying to barter and negotiate. It's about oneness. Are you sharing your life? Are you vulnerable? Are you holding nothing back? Everything is shared. In your strife, are you looking at the difficulties that you're struggling with in your marriage and seeing that conflict? Are you seeing it instead, not as my spouse is bad, if they were only better, everything would be good? No, the Lord could be using that to sanctify you. It's an opportunity to learn how to love your spouse better. Don't look at them and say, no, it's them. This is an opportunity to love someone that doesn't seem very lovable at the time. What kind of marriage do you want? Is it a selfless one? Is it one in covenant? Is it one that uh, is stubborn like the way that God loves us? If we are daily in our words and actions preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way we do marriage, then I declare that you guys are going to see an epic marriage, beautiful, majestic, unroll in front of you that will make All the riches of the earth seem like rags. I know a lot of people, or quite a few people, who are wealthy. I know some multi-millionaires. I know a lot more of them than I know of people with worthy and wonderful marriages. Do you know why? It's because the marriage that is amazing is more rare than riches. And it is certainly more costly we could build that, guys. I say we stay married for life. Who's with me? Amen. Jesus, I pray for everyone in this room, for those who are not married, I pray that you would help ready them so that they are marriage material, that you'd also prepare their spouse and help them in the selection of that uh, person so that they would be equally yoked in your name. I also pray for every marriage in the room, those that are young, those that are old, that regardless of where they are in this moment, that you would reignite fire in their lives so that they're able to uh, forget the wrongs done to them, to be able to take the bitterness that is developed and absolutely uh, throw it to the winds and look at their spouse with determined, stubborn, romantic love and love them even when they don't deserve it because that's how you've loved us. Help us be better spouses so that we can forge better marriages and keep us from the enemy who above all desires to destroy our marriages and so in so doing destroy us. You are mighty Jesus. We look forward to you and what you're doing. Amen.